so I actually started out uh, interested in linguistics and psychology. And at, Symbol at, at Stanford, uh, where I attended for my undergrad, there's an interdisciplinary major called Symbolic Systems that's a mix of psychology, linguistics, computer science, and philosophy. And uh, one of the concentrations you can do there is human-computer interaction. I was trying a little bit of everything, and I fell in love. Uh, and that's what I ended up uh, majoring in and studying. So today we're going to be talking about how, design, how data drives design at NASA. My colleagues Dave and Liz are going to be walking through, uh, we're all going to be walking through different case studies. Uh, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about our team. So we have a team of about 30 researchers, designers, engineers, and QA. And then we also have 30 plus websites and integrations that supports both the manned space flight program and the International Space Station. So all the boxes on this, uh, on this graph are current or planned websites and all the lines going into that center box Digit uh, have integrations but with other websites in the system. So Digit's our, our uh, integration platform that integrates all the sites together. So Dave and I are going to be talking today about two of those individual websites, and Liz is going to be talking about once you integrate those sites, what you can do with that integration. Okay, and so the project I'm going to be walking you through as my case study is called Itashit. Uh, Itashit, uh, it was requested by the ArcJet testing facility. The ArcJet testing facility is where the thermal heat shield material is tested. As you can see, the, the, this is the arc uh, the arc, it's the, the stream in the arc, it gets really hot. In fact, it can get hotter than the sun. And uh, you can, you basically put the heat shield material in here and you figure out how much it's going to melt. And the heat shield material then protects the spacecraft during reentry. And so what happens is that a scientist or principal investigator has, they create a graph of all of the conditions that the heat shield material is going to experience during reentry. Then they take a sample of those points along the path, and those become their test conditions that they run in the ArcJet test facility. So they have all these different points. They expose the heat shield material to those, to those different conditions within the ArcJet, which is this extremely flexible environment. You can actually mimic different atmospheres of different planets in, this, um, in the test facility. They see how much it melts, and from there they can extrapolate and determine uh, how much that heat shield material is going to to melt overall during the reentry process so that they have a margin of error, they have enough heat shield material, they know that people and payloads are going to be safe. So the ArcJet test facility is pretty important for NASA. So you may be asking yourself, what is a task sheet? So <laughs> a task sheet has the list of tasks that are very important to make sure that the test is run correctly. So there, there's a lot of moving parts in the facility. It can actually take two to three weeks to set up the facility before the test even happens. There's a lot of steps that have to happen in order to set up that facility, and some of them are so important that if they're not done correctly, then the test results might not be valid. So how do I, as a customer, know that the test results are valid? I have a task sheet. The task sheet says what the, which steps were completed, and there's documentation of who did them. I'm going to go into that a little bit more. So that's what a task sheet is. That's why it's important. And so now I'm at uh, the request that our group got, which was to create a task sheet system that will digitally capture signatures, accommodate on-the-fly edits, and provide better archiving for ArcJet certification tests. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, our approach. So we did a, mi a mix of contextual inquiries and also artifact analysis. So the, the process is pretty complex. So we, uh, we, came, we went in to observe the end-to-end -end process on uh, two different test days to see how the task sheets were actually being used. That helped us understand all the process ro rules, all the roles involved. And then we did an artifact analysis. So there's a lot of variation that can happen within, within tests and between tests. And so by doing uh, an artifact analysis, that's to help us see the, uh, a bigger sample of the type of data we could expect so that we can make sure we could build something to support their process. So first I'm going to walk through the findings from our contextual inquiry. So I'm going to introduce you to the folks that we talked to. So first we have the principal investigator. The principal investigator is the scientist. They want the test plan to be completed so that they can then make design recommendations. Is this heat shield material good? Will it work for the mission? And how much heat shield material do we need? There's also the quality assurance role. 
Quality Assurance wants to verify or witness key steps uh, to make sure they're completed correctly and so that the results are valid. So what happens is that uh, in addition to tests that are simply completed, there's some tests that are incredibly important. Things like making sure the correct test article is installed, things like that. You want to make sure you're testing the thing that you think that you're testing. And someone actually has, and a QA representative has to actually observe that task being completed and then sign off that yes, they observed it, they're sure that it was completed correctly. Uh, for a verification is for steps that uh, can be verified after the fact. So after the completion, the QA role can go in and verify that, that, was, that the task was completed correctly. The, then there's a test engineer. So the test engineer is basically the project manager for the ArcJet testing facility, and they're the interface with the customer. So the customer has a test that they want to run, they have test conditions, and the test engineer is working with them to say, okay, I know the facility, I know how it works, and I'm gonna help you figure out how to run your test uh, break up your test run as efficiently as possible and make sure that we're testing what you want to test. And they're actually authoring the task sheet, they're making updates, they do complete some tasks and things like that, and they're the ones interfacing with the customer to make sure they're happy. So additionally, we have 20 plus engineers who are working in the facility. They're, they're configuring this facility and completing the task to make sure that, um, to get it set up. And they're, the consum they're some of the consumers of the, the task sheet. So those are the different roles and uh, an overview of how they face with the task sheet. And so I'm gonna talk about some of our, our findings about the process. So the, there's really uh, this before and after where at first the, the test engineers have an authoring period where they're, act where they're writing the, the task sheet. And then uh, they can make as many changes as they want. But when, before, when it was a paper process, once they printed it out and distributed it to folks, it's, it's gone live and now there's a whole new set of rules. So at that point, any changes that are made have to be documented. And additionally, if there's any changes to a step that was one of those important steps that required a witness or a verification, now that has to be reviewed with QA. There has to be an additional concurrence on that step, on that change. They also need to be able to see quickly see whether or not tasks are completed. Engineers need to know which tasks are remaining so that they know what work that they can work on. And QA and the test engineers need to know how many are left over. So uh, on test run day, so we want to actually fire up the, uh, the, the facility, they need to know that all the steps before, there's actually a step that says, you know, turn on the arc jet. They need to know that all the steps before that point have been completed. Unfortunately, the flip side of that is that the task sheet layout makes it hard to tell if the tasks have actually been completed. And so I have some examples here. Can you tell me by looking at this whether or not all the tasks have been completed? Uh, me personally, I have to actually count through and figure out, okay, I have five steps. Do I have that many signatures? What about this one? So here there's been some hand edits and there's two steps here that require a witness signature, and there's been some changes. Can you tell me whether or not the concurrence has been signed? In this case, I know, I actually know the people who are allowed to sign concurrent signatures. I know their initials, so I can kind of work backwards and figure out, yes, it has actually been signed. But these are, this is a high pressure situation. People need to be able to quickly make decisions based on and. Uh, just figure out, hey, do we have additional work to do? Do I need to find this person, have this be done? Um, so that's one of the issues that we, that they, they themselves reported. Uh, so each, the task sheets themselves ha have uh, common repeating patterns. For example, you're always gonna install some kind of sensor and, or, and test articles. You're gonna be installing something in the ArcJet to either measure or test. And so that's a common section that you have across task sheets. And so what folks do is they'll duplicate the, the task sheet and then use it for their next test. But then you have, you might be referencing that same serial number multiple times within that sheet because you need to polish it, you need to install it, and every time you're, you're stating the serial number so that's clear to folks which one they're doing. And then you run into issues like, that you always have with copy paste where you forget to update some of those versions and then it gets confusing, you have to you have to make updates uh, after the after the task sheet has gone out. It's ready and it is in this configuration change mode. 
And then lastly, the solution must be as portable and adaptable as the current paper task sheet. Even though the paper task sheet was hard to read, it was hard to tell what was completed, it is super fast. If I have a change, I can just grab it, cross it out, uh, and sign right there. It's very quick. Okay. So next I'm going to walk through the artifact analysis. As I mentioned before, we, pull, we, we watched two test days. The artifact analysis allowed us to look at a large set of data and see uh, and, and make sure that uh, we'd be able to handle all the data inputs that they had. Okay. So this is the, an overview of what, uh, what goes on the task sheet. There's some basic metadata information. There's also attachments. So some steps, uh, for example, might have a wiring diagram. You have to text, test the capacitance of all the different wires and make sure they're actually working. Um, so there will be attachment for that so you, you can read and test those different things. And then there's also tasks that have to be completed. Uh, those have their own, diff there's, there's another breakdown within there where you can have notes, something like remember to wear clean gloves then there's step groups, which are what you probably think of as the tasks that have to be completed and then signed off on. Uh, a QA sign off, that's that, uh, that transition from the pre-test to actually doing the test. And then discrepancies if there are any. The step groups are made up of steps. And then the steps themselves are made up of, of, of fields. And this was interesting because this was uh, sometimes when you're completing a task, the person completing the task has to provide supplemental information. Uh, for example, if you're installing a window, you have to say which window you installed because each window is individually tracked and calibrated because there's instrumentation that's taking readings through that window. So you need to know which one was installed and so they need to be able to enter that, that serial number in there. So there's some data that's going to have to be entered by the engineers and people completing the tasks. So in terms of the design, we decided to have a web interface where, that, where the test engineer would enter the task sheet and then they can make all the edits that they needed to. And then when they were ready for it to, the task to be completed, they would put it into the ready status. At that point, we had a, I'm sure you won't be surprised to find that we had a tablet interface. The ta tablet interface was a simplified version of the website that focused on the tasks that need to be completed as well as the signatures. Um, there they could read, they could uh, enter the pins to sign signatures. And then I'm gonna walk through some of those in depth. So. You'll be able to see that the artifact analysis, there was a very uh, clear transition to the, to the actual design of, the, of the, the website. So the sections that we identified are the sections that we have on the, on the website for authoring. These are the subsections. These are the steps. Here's the, the area where the, the test engineer could identify which fields needed to have additional data entry at completion. I mentioned before that there were, there were errors with uh, copying and with doing basically a save as of task sheets. So what we did is we added this functionality that we call variables. And the, what this allows you to do is enter that data once. So you enter that you have a calorimeter or a test article or something like that one time. And then you can reuse it on any step anywhere on the sheet. Then if you delete it, it's deleted everywhere. If you need to update it, it's updated everywhere. So now you have one spot where you're doing that one place and you don't have to go find all the, all the entries on the page and update it. So when we're in that go state, that ready state, we have to track changes. So now the way that it works is that in the web interface, the test engineer makes the updates that they need to make and that's it. The system is automatically tracking them. The system knows the, the, all the process rules. It knows if, if we now need to add a concurrent signature. And so that just happens autom automatically by the system. So here you can see that the calorimeter serial number was updated and that the concurred by signature was added because there was a witness on that step. And then you can also, this is what it looks like on the iPad. So you have that highlight. And then you can expand the revision history to see what the specific, what the specific change was. And that will have the, any, the history of all the changes that were made. This is an example of entering the data and signing off on completion. You can see here there's a close association between the step and the signature. It's easy to see whether or not the step has been signed. We also added a progress bar. So this is the QA sign off. When they go to sign off on the, on the to say that, okay, we're good, we can turn on the RCHF facility, 
There's no ambiguity. It's clear that all the tasks have been signed or not. So in this case, they haven't. Um, this is an example where the, the remaining signatures on this test have been signed. So now the progress shows all the, all, this, all the tasks up to this point have been signed. We're ready to go. So that's basically what, the, what, what it looked like at deployment. And then we were expecting that there might be some changes that we'd have to make afterwards. So we did some follow-up interviews to see uh, how it was going. And one of, the, one of our surprising findings is so previously, we had identified this need to be able to quickly see which tasks had been completed. And what we found was that that really wasn't quite right. Um, there was still this lingering anxiety that things uh, about completion, because this is a group where it's very important to them that the, that, that the steps are completed, that things are accurate, so they're still triple checking. And really, it wasn't just that it needed to be completed, it's that they needed to be confident that the steps were completed. And so, previously, uh, one of our design rules within our group is that we generally don't enforce the NASA, whatever the NASA process is, because there's almost always an exception, or a supervisor can override the process, provide a signature, or something like that. But we already had that capability in the tool. So we updated the process to actually enforce the order of operations. So if you don't enter in the data entry for the field, you can't sign off on the completed buy. Uh, you have to, it highlights in red, you have to go back and enter that gate valve open time before you can sign off. So you have to fill out the field before you can sign the signature and all these little process rules for what has to happen first before the next thing can happen are enforced in the system. The next is that uh, we, taking it a step further, so uh, at the end of the process, the TASHI is approved, and uh, we have made it so that you basically can't approve, you cannot approve a TASHI if there are any incomplete steps. So if you go into the ETASHI system, you see that an ETASHI has been approved, 100% confidence, everything in there has been complete. Additionally, before that has actually happened and the, the TASHI has been approved, we also provided some additional feedback within the system so you could always see the completion. So you wouldn't have to scan through the TASHI to see whether or not everything was complete. Uh, on the home page, we have bubbled up the percent completeness so that you can see it at a glance. And then also, we have this table of contents we added where you can flip back and forth between the task sheets in a test run or in a test series, and from there you can see that, uh, from there you can see what the current progress is without having to review the TASHI itself. And then we found that at that point, what we're really looking for is that warm, fuzzy feeling from this group of people that all those, that they're confident that this, the process is being followed, that the tasks are being completed, and that they can quickly find out that information. Okay, so that's a summary of the ETASHI system. Now my colleague Dave is going to walk through a case study of the SLS data exchange, aka DEX. I'm going to cheat and use notes. I'm going to cheat and use notes. All right. Uh, thanks, Crystal. Um, so yeah, um, everyone going to hear me okay? Um, yeah, Crystal talked to you a bit about uh, eTask Sheet, and um, I'm going to talk about something that's also in the human space flight domain, um, and you know, as Crystal mentioned, kind of still related to that suite of project, uh, suite of products that our group works on. Um, a little bit about me, I guess, to begin. Um, my background is in sociology and in human computer interaction. Um, I did an undergrad in sociology at uh, University of Illinois. And then I decided I didn't want to be an academic, so I was trying to figure out what to do with that. And, um, and now I'm going to walk away from the mic and see if people can still hear me. Um, and uh, yes, um, the uh, uh, and kind of I started getting involved in you know computing as it related to sociology, um, and so I did a little bit of work with uh, digital inequality. Um, I volunteered at a retirement community, you know, teaching computer skills, and I said, boy. This is all terrible. How can I help? Um, and so I got involved in Carnegie Mellon's master's program in HCI, and we, you know, uh, they do a, master, um, a master's capstone with NASA almost every year. And when I saw that logo on the screen during the open house, I said, I have a sociology degree and I can work at NASA? Great. 
Uh, sign me up. Um, took a few years to get there, but now I'm here and I've been loving it ever since. Um, so yeah. Um, and uh, uh, so yeah, I have a case study to go over today. Um, and uh, it's uh, kind of about how um, we structured qualitative data on a project uh, in order to kind of achieve, achieve success. Um, uh, and um, yeah, so it's SLS Data Exchange, or abbreviated as DEX. NASA loves acronyms. And what it is, it's a uh, web application that you know supports the delivery of data among NASA um, engineers. Um, so um, you know, when it comes to qualitative data, uh, something I've personally struggled with, and I'm sure folks in the room have as well, is like, okay, you have, you end up with a bunch of notes, and how do you actually translate that into a product that actually helps people do uh, what you want to help them do? Um, and it's not always very straightforward. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, and we're unplugged from this, so I'll go back to this, is you know how we structured and quantified some of our qualitative findings in order to achieve our product goals, as well as uh, communicate with our clients. Um, so uh, a bit of background first. Um, after NASA retired the space shuttle, uh, we needed a new way to get to space. And uh, this is it. It's the SLS, or the Space Launch System. And it's the most complex vehicle ever built. And um, it's made up of various components. So there's the core stage, the engines, the booster on the side there, and all manner of things. Um, and each of these components is designed and built by different teams within the agency, and then under those teams, different contractors. So in order to literally put it all together in the end, construct the vehicle on the pad, in addition to even just put the design together, they all need to send each other stuff. Um, and what they're sending each other is um, things like schematics, or drawings, or just like math calculations here. Um, Throw back to Katherine Johnson. Um, and so, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of paperwork to go to space is basically um, uh, one way to put it. And what we were finding, uh, kind of the prompt we got at the beginning of this project, uh, where the SLS uh, folks, our clients, came to us, um, you know, things weren't necessarily being delivered on time. They weren't necessarily being complete, uh, delivered in like a complete way. Um, and uh, you know, it was also pretty difficult to get everyone to sign off or approve the things that have been delivered. So if someone who works on the booster needs some models from the people who work on the engines, it wasn't always clear when they were gonna get it or when they got it, it was gonna be the right thing. Um, so we set out to make that process faster uh, by breaking down some key barriers and then hopefully you know, improving the reliability of those deliveries. But how did we go about it? How did we approach the data? Um, well, we did it in four steps. Um, the first was we collected data, and we did that through user interviews and um, generative workshops with our clients. Uh, we structured the data uh, by kind of clean, cleaning it up and tagging it uh, with various themes and classifying it. Um, we prioritized our findings once they had been cleaned up, um, and we wanted to determine you know, what came up the most, what's most important, what issues are the most severe? What are the things that are going to be most worth it to tackle? And then finally, we translated uh, that data into outputs. Um, and those outputs were user stories and opportunity statements. And I'll go into all of this in detail as I go through my talk. Um, so the first thing we did was we collected data. And we did that through 13 user interviews. And that was with folks from a variety of roles in the process. So there's engineers who actually create the data, right? They're doing the math, they're drawing the models. Um, there's folks who take on more of an approver role, and these folks you know, sign off. They say, that looks good, I think that's appropriate to send. You can send it to the other program, the other uh, group of people. Um, there's also people who fulfill more of a scheduler role. And what these folks do is they kind of monitor everything, and they want to make sure stuff's being delivered on time, and you know, they want the overview. So we wanted to make sure that our, you know, our interviews kind of covered that uh, gamut of different types of users. And the other thing we did was uh, we did a generative workshop, um, actually two of them, with our actual client groups. Um, the first was to have them think about and brainstorm the goals for their project. Uh, tactically, what do you want to achieve? Uh, and strategically, what do you want to achieve? And how do we get there? As well as actually getting them drawing on paper and saying, 
what are your, some of your design ideas? What features do you think we need, right? Um, so we took that all as you know, our data together. Um, now, uh, for our research in particular, a dedicated note taker was critical because um, one caveat on our team for kind of various cultural and like legal reasons, we don't usually record our user interview sessions. Um, so that makes it really important that we take very, very thorough notes uh, so that we actually have a more or less accurate picture of what took place in those interviews. Um, so, you know, Nielsen and Norman have written about this. Erica Hall has written about this. Um, you know, you want to set up someone who facilitates, who asks the questions, keeps the conversation moving forward, and someone whose job pretty much is exclusively to take notes and record. Um, it's really hard to do both at the same time, and doubly so when you need to make sure that those notes are extremely thorough. Um, so, at the end of this, though, we had thousands of notes, and they were kind of in like a stream of consciousness format. So it was, you know, not really in a usable state yet. Um, and you know, if we really wanted to do something with these, we were going to have to clean them up. We were going to have to structure them uh, in some way that we could use them and explain them. Um, and you know, we wanted to be able to make sense of our own data, and we wanted to be able to share it out with our clients so that there was a clear story. Um, you know, the task that we had was very broad. It was go make this process faster. So um, we really wanted to make sure that the evidence was in a state where it could guide us into you know, solving our problem. Um, so the way that we structured it and kind of put it together was with this concept called nuggets. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Holtzblatt and Bayer, um, they encourage folks when they're coming through their data to make standalone you know, bits of information. Um, each note captures one key point from the interview and is self-contained, right? It can be understood without reference to the notes on either side. Um, and then the term nuggets comes from um, uh, Tomer Sharon, who I think works at WeWork now, um, but he's done a bit of writing on this. Um, and you know, he calls them the atomic unit of a research insight. So I like that word for them. Um, and I'll kind of show you what I mean by what a nugget is. So if we take this raw note here, um, this is directly copied from this kind of stream of consciousness notes that uh, our note taker took. Um, and it was very like data delivery example for whatever reason. It has a, to be a wet signature that has to be signed. Who had signed changed several times over the last four months? She had the wrong person. That's not super usable by itself, right? That's just someone literally typing down as quickly as they can what our participant is saying. We translated that over to a nugget, kind of a standalone piece of prose that we can use and share out. So when signing off on data exchanges, it has to be a wet signature, and that means ink right, on a piece of paper. The person who had to sign off changed several times over the past four months, and the participant had the wrong person sign and had to regenerate the memo. So we have like a nice little story here. And we basically created you know, a couple hundred of those based on our thousands of notes. Um, and the way we organized them was in Airtable. So you can see here that um, each of these little lines is a nugget. It's all linked together. Um, and uh, I'll go into more detail a little bit later, but using Airtable for this project ended up being very successful because you can link everything together and it becomes kind of a home base for the project, right? You can link these nuggets back to the participant they came from. You can link them forward into you know, what features you ended up generating from them and all that. But if we zoom in here, you know, we can see some of the other nuggets that we created. So I create 40 to 50 charts per week. Um, someone wanted to show us additional info. On Mondays, there is a particular meeting where they meet with C you know, a bunch of NASA acronyms. But the idea is that you know, each of these is a standalone idea that stands by itself. Um, once we had all the nuggets in hand, we went back and we tagged them with various themes. And so these are going to be the groups uh, of notes in order to, again, distill down the story into things that are a little more tangible. Um, and so um, if you take, you know, again, this nugget that I uh, showed a second ago, when signing off on data exchanges, it has to be a wet signature, et cetera. Um, we found out that we had a couple dozen notes that had to do with this idea of signatures and having to, you know, go get a physical signature and how that, you know, caused a lot of uh, kind of delays. Um, so we grouped all of those into a theme that's just, I spend a lot of time chasing signatures. So um, 
that's kind of a you know example there, and um, so you can see there's a couple notes here that had to do with that. And we tagged with multiple, so you can see a couple of the other examples of the uh, themes we generated. So there's another theme here that's that the process was too long and complex. Uh, I can't find the person I need. Um, so again, taking our uh, you know hundreds of um, uh, nuggets and tagging them each with a theme in order to group them further. Um, so with that in hand, we uh, were able to start kind of prioritizing things. Um, and, uh, you know, we wanted to quantify our qualitative data a bit um, in order to figure out, again, what's the most, what are the most important issues? Where might we start solving some of the issues we saw, uh, saw during our research? Um, so, um, oops. here's kind of a simple bar chart we put together. Each of these items is one of the themes we created. So you can imagine if we did this with all thousand of our notes or with all hundred of our nuggets, that this would become you know, very untenable. Um, but by breaking it down into just a few dozen themes, we were able to kind of show how often they came up in our research, right? So I can't find the people I need came up quite a lot. Um, I think the process takes too long came up quite a lot uh, and so on and so on. Really able to see kind of what are uh, some of the most pressing issues? What are the things that people were talking about the most in our interviews? And the other thing we did is, okay, we had a sense of how often stuff came up, but we really didn't necessarily know, uh, like, how bad was it if it occurred? Um, and uh, so if you're familiar with, like, an impact achievability matrix, right, so if there's features that are really easy to build and there'll be high impact, maybe do those. And if there's ones that are going to be really hard and ones that uh, don't provide a lot of value, you can probably safely ignore those. We kind of did the inverse. We did a prevalence severity matrix, trying to plot, you know, how often did we hear something in uh, the interviews versus how bad would it be, you know, if that happened. Um, so admittedly, the severity part is a little bit more subjective. It's based on our subject matter expertise as well as that of our clients and other subject matter experts. Um, but that's kind of how we plotted it uh, further in order to get a sense of kind of where should we start solving this. So if I go back to the signatures example, um, number four here, we can see that it wasn't necessarily super prevalent, um, but we knew that it was pretty severe. So if you don't get the signatures on time, then kind of the whole process gets delayed, and that's a big impact. So we know that that's something that we want to address, and we know that it's something that's probably going to be in our top set of issues to um, you know, solve moving forward. So. We kind of have, uh, you know, we've prioritized, we've structured, we've collected everything. Um, but now, uh, you know, we want to actually turn it into something that can help us move forward with the project and create a product that can help solve some of these issues. So we did two things. Um, we created opportunity statements and we created user stories. And I'll talk about uh, what each of these were. So opportunity statements. Um, a lot of times when you hear about qualitative research, you hear about insights, right? You take these sentences that are the crux of the data, the takeaways, and that's essentially what our opportunity statements were. Um, we just framed them as opportunities for a couple of reasons. Um, so for us, they helped us frame the problem in a way that was easier for clients and us to understand, right? It's good to have a clear sense of the narrative yourself. Um, and then it you know, guided the product decisions and the user stories down the line. So does this help us address this opportunity? If yes, great. Um, if this idea does not help us address a particular opportunity, maybe we revisit. Maybe there's an opportunity that we didn't think about before, um, or maybe it's something that we shouldn't actually do. Um, but the other thing is, the reason we frame them as opportunities, and I'll show you what one looks like in a second, is that rather than a list of like problems dragging us down, we had a list of amazing opportunities propelling us forward. So instead of saying like signatures are hard, you know, we want to be like there's an opportunity to. Uh, um, you know, there's an opportunity to reduce the time required for sign-off, right? So it's like, great, let's, you know, take on this challenge. Um, so the thing I went through really quick there is, you know, you recall the theme from before. I spent a lot of time chasing signatures. Well, that theme, we determined through kind of our measurement and our prioritization that it indeed was something that was super important that we wanted to tackle. So we transformed it into kind of one of five opportunity statements that we went through. And that was, there's an opportunity to reduce the time for sign off. And then we ended up with kind of five of these at the end. Um, we wanted to make it easier to find and access material. We wanted to uh, help people find the right people more quickly. 
Uh, we wanted to more effectively communicate data relationships. Um, we wanted to keep the conversation unified. Uh, there were a lot of issues where you know stuff was getting lost in email inboxes, et cetera. And then the one I just mentioned, you know, reduce the time needed for sign off. Um, happy to talk about any of these uh, after the talk, but you know I'm kind of focused on the one example today in the interest of time. The other thing we created uh, from our data was user stories. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar, I'm sure a bunch of people are, but just a quick recap, you know, a user story. Um, is kind of a way to describe a feature of a product in a way that keeps the human in the loop. And it's that feature from the perspective of the user kind of describing its capabilities. And typically it follows a format like this, right? As a type of user, I want to do some action so I can achieve some kind of outcome. And if we take some of the nuggets that we generated having to do with this signature space and sign off space, uh, we came up with you know a whole smattering of user stories. Some examples are as an approver, uh, I want to sign off, sign off on data items uh, from a central location, so I don't have to spend time going back and forth over email. As a data user, I want to request digital approval so that I can save time on gathering wet signatures. And as a scheduler, I want to see all of the signatures in one document so I understand whether a delivery is ready to move forward. And those are just three examples from the you know, many dozens of user stories we generated. Um, and so you can see them organized here in the Airtable again, and I'll zoom in a little bit. So here's a couple of these, you know, as a user, I want to enter data records in a structured form. As a router, which is another one of the roles, I want to see a name for who is expected to deliver the item so I don't have to, um, you know, hunt them down, basically. And another great thing about the way we collected this is then we were able to tie that directly back to some of the opportunity statements we created, right? So there's one right there, reduce the time for sign off. As a requester, I want to sign off on data items. So always able to link back and have that clear thread from our original research all the way to the end product. So that's a little bit about how we you know, gathered the data, prioritized it, and turned it into outputs. Um, now, how did we actually use that evidence to make a product? Uh, we can talk about that a little bit. So recall all the things I talked about before. Um, we had the opportunity statement. There's an opportunity to reduce the time required for sign off and those three user stories that are related to it. And what that resulted in for us was a feature having to do with digital signatures. And Crystal actually showed a little bit of this um, with eTask Sheet as well. But the basic premise is that within DEX, um, within its many features, there's a digital signatures feature in which um, people can request, approve, uh, reject, uh, a signature with one click, basically. So we see here that, you know, Naomi, she's requested that James uh, sign something for her, um, and then he can go in there and do it in one click. In this case, he added a comment that said it looks good. Um, he can also reject it, at which point it puts a big red X and someone has to go and fix it. But um, the idea is taking this entire process that we learned about and kind of comb through our notes to figure out of someone having to wander the hallways in an office in order to find 10 different, you know, signatures in ink that they need in order to move the process forward. Now, it's all in a digital system. One click, it's done. People get emails when this happens, so they're all in the loop. So that's just one example of how kind of doing all this upfront research results in kind of an end feature. But okay, we made a feature, that's cool. Did it work? It did. Um, so uh, here's a little bit about how our product uh, supported some of the outcomes that we were hoping to get. Um, so it turns out that at the end of this, um, the whole process from making a data request, hey, I need those models, to when it's delivered, here they are and signed off and approved, uh, we found that DEX has helped uh, our users uh, go about four times faster. So it used to take about 60 days for this process, uh, 60 days on average for this process to go from end to end. Now it takes about 15. Then if we take that smaller piece, that signature piece, you know, once something is delivered, how long does it take to actually get approved? We found that we're going about three times faster. So um, whereas it used to take about eight days on average, now it takes about three days on average. And then, so that's some of the impacts we had, which we're really proud of. Um, and then there's kind of this little bit of a side story here about how our data and how we decided to analyze the data helped us communicate. So if, um, and that's, you know, by building trust and using evidence to facilitate tough conversations. Um, if you're familiar with Mike Montero's work at all, he's a book called You're My Favorite Client, and then he says, designers can design a solution to a problem, but they can't design a solution to a disagreement. Um, 
And we found this to be the case in DEX. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of passionate folks at NASA, a lot of passionate folks working in the SLS. And kind of the reason we were called in, right, was to kind of make sense of this problem. Um, so we would see that, um, you know, we would enter into the room and we'd have various stakeholders who were a little skeptical, right? Like, here's two dudes from California coming in to say, here's how we should do our work. No one wants that. And we don't want to do that either, right? We want to come in. We want to listen empathetically. We want to use evidence to respectfully guide the conversation um, in a way that supports successful outcomes. And so, you know, uh, those opportunity statements, they really helped us have a clear narrative and distill uh, the project down into um, a story that made sense to everyone, right? So we weren't going to go to a client meeting and say, here's our air table with 1,000 cells. Cool, right? That's not helpful for anybody. Um, you know, we, we really wanted to target in on those distilled uh, story points um, in order to kind of, you know, again, explain that narrative and make it something that's very clear. And the other thing that we had um, is that we had a clear thread from beginning to end. So if someone said, hey, why is, this, why is this feature important? Why should we be working on it? Why should we be funding that feature? We can go back and say, well, the evidence shows this. And we have that clear thread all the way from a person who said it in a user interview all the way to that feature at the end. And we can go into our data and we can clearly point to, well, you know, from this set of notes, we created uh, you know, these themes and we grouped those themes into these uh, opportunities and created these user stories and that's you know, the thread. And having all that data at hand was very helpful for having those conversations. So kind of in conclusion, um, uh, we found that on this particular project, opportunity statements, uh, they really helped us frame and communicate the problem. And then the user stories helped us take concrete action on those opportunities. And that led us to some pretty successful outcomes um, where we actually accelerated the process by quite a bit. Um, and uh, we were able to kind of communicate that clearly to clients. So I think that's all I have. Yes, and I'll hand it off to Liz, who's gonna talk about uh, something a little more quantitative, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Great. Switch to my mic now. Yep, okay. Uh, I'm Liz, and uh, a couple lines to introduce myself. Um, I studied psychology in undergrad at UNC and was thinking about going the PhD route, um, decided against it, and uh, was then thinking about doing graphic design at the time, actually, because I was uh, worked as a photographer and did a lot of um, editing and uh, talked to a friend at the time who was a graphic designer, and she said, with your HCI, with your, sorry, with your psychology background, you might be interested in this thing called HCI. Um, then I found the master's program that both of our other students also went to, um, the MHCI program at Carnegie Mellon, and went there. And then was hired at NASA, and I've been there for uh, almost three years now. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about search log analysis. Um, so this is actually a little bit different than most of the research we do because it is a little bit more quantitative like Dave said. Um, we typically work with a lot of um, smaller, most of them are smaller user groups. Um, and for this project though, um, here, actually I'll go on. Okay, so first, um, yeah. So we'll, uh, quote to start from Nielsen Norman Group, the analysis of site search logs is one of the biggest missed opportunities in UX research um, and was something we decided to pursue and I'm gonna do a call back to the diagram Crystal showed earlier. Um, she mentioned that we have a lot of these different databases and uh, kind of as we get closer to the um, planned launch dates, um, the different people working in these different systems kind of need to work together more and um, look at this kind of integrated data to make sure uh, things are kind of running as planned. And that's where this, um, the green search box came in up there. That's what I'm gonna be talking about. It's one of the cross-cutting views um, that we're calling cross-system search right now. We'll see if it gets better branding. Um, and with that, it's really about looking into these different data sets and being able to search across them instead of having to log into each individual account um, if you have an account in that system to be able to see that data. Um, so this is what a search page looks like in our system. Um, to start this project, uh, we decided to um, do the search log analysis of our existing systems to see how users are searching through them currently before we build this new application. Um, so 
this is kind of one of our systems OMS and they all most for the most part look like this um, they'd have like a different header different logo and then this is the kind of the advanced search page within that system um, so you can see kind of different criteria there um, all kind of specific to the system what those fields are and field values are going to be um, and then the overall goal for this project was basically to inform the strategies for our design development and testing with quantitative evidence from search and the user activity logs um, so I would say to inform strategies versus uh, informing decisions because there's uh, certain limitations to this data and I'll go into that a little bit more um, but basically wanted you to use this kind of as our our first round of um, research for this overall project and uh, strategies more so than decisions just because um, it'll help us kind of know what to tackle first and where to look better basically uh, so I'm gonna go over our methods first then the insights and strategies we got out of this some of the limitations like I said and our overall takeaways um, so with the methods um, for each of the insights and everything I'm going to explain, I'm going to go through four kind of examples. And with each of these, I'm going to explain the user research question we asked, um, what metrics we saw using Splunk, um, which is basically just a product to go through data and um, create metrics for us to look at. You can use other various products. Um, we're using several different ones now. Um, and then we're, I'm going to show some of the insights that we got at different levels. And then um, we use that to try to adjust the strategies for our um, design, dev, and testing of our team. Um, and then when I speak about the strategies a little bit, this is just kind of a key to show you that um, for each of the ones I show, I'm gonna use this like search, MAS, and NASA um, section. So for search, this one um, means that it informs strategy specifically for this project versus MAS is our team um, mission assurance system. So um, that these insights could be more widely used on our team. And then for NASA as a whole, I have one um, specifically that uh, targets more about our agency. And okay, so into our insights. So the first one is um, we wanted to know about um, how people were using our keyword search versus our criteria search. So what I mean by that is, again, here's our search page. And um, this top portion here is one that you can see across um, any of our pages. So if you were on anything there in the toolbar, you would be able to do a keyword search from there, which is called quick search for us, versus this area in the middle is more of our criteria-based search. So you're using specific fields, specific field values, um, but that you can only access from the advanced search page. Um, but it's also a little tricky because you can also do a keyword search within the advanced search page. So in terms of looking at the search logs to see what were people were doing, um, there's yeah, a little bit of variance there. Um, so our first question for this one is, how often is full text keyword search used versus our criteria? And uh, this is basically what we found. Um, so the advanced search there is the one that is um, just criteria based, and that was found to be used about 60% of the time. Um, whereas keyword only search was used 33% and then where it's the criteria combined with keyword search was almost 10% of the time. Um, and again, so that would be one where you're on that page and you're searching, you'd put in a keyword as well as click on some of the criteria. Um, so our insights for this, where the majority of searches were criteria based um, and keyword search is a minority, but not insignificant for our purposes. Um, some of the uh, strategies this informed um, for design to have dev and testing um, were that we should design, uh, develop and test criteria based searching first for our application um, and then include keyword search since it's a significant amount of use and it should be for search, uh, but we don't need to necessarily optimize for it. Um, and I have this as a search strategy as well as for a team strategy for Maz. Um, basically because uh, in future um, design and testing when we're trying to improve our search or just testing our system um, we can focus more on the criteria based searching rather than keyword um, our next kind of line of question was around our common queries and we want to know what are the most commonly used search criteria of those that we have on the page and for this one we use Splunk 
to um, find the top search parameters, and um, you can kind of see the screenshot there. Um, it's not terribly important, but it's just kind of a list of different values and the percentage that those are searched on. And to highlight some of those, um, status was the most common search criteria for us. 21% um, of all searches included status. Um, for status, for our data type, um, it's basically like finding out where in the process a document is for the most part. Um, so for example here I have is drafts. This one could be in a draft state or it could be um, being reviewed by someone, um, being looked at to be signed off on um, as we've talked about and then it could be approved or rejected or withdrawn for various reasons. Um, so that's kind of one of the more important things that people search on. Um, they want to know what's the state of their uh, data. And then within status, draft was the most common criteria. Um, 74% of our status searches were for either new draft, in work, or open, depending on the different database you use. They all use um, slightly different uh, terminology. And then our second most common criteria search for was data type. 12% uh, of all searches included uh, classification and record type. Those are just two fields that determine type for us. And then our record ID is the third most common criteria used. Um, and this one's interesting. For us, record ID is the, a unique value to determine a specific record in the system. Um, so when we say 10% of all searches are included, uh, included one or more record ID, um, it's interesting because that one means it's not exactly them. They're not really searching they're more using that ID as a, a way to navigate to a specific record or a specific set of records that they already know they want to find. So it's slightly different in uh, the use case. And then after these three I just mentioned, status, data type, and record ID, all other criteria were in less than 10% of searches. So those full queries were, um, yeah, just a bit too different to kind of really determine trends between. Um, but we have some limitations there in that, um, they're, yeah, they're just too different to determine with what we were using at the time um, and the tool and the way we were setting up these different um, kind of s metrics within Splunk were um, maybe not sophisticated enough to determine those trends yet. And some of our strategies out of this were more, mostly for our development um, for the search project specifically um, that we'd prefer to do the full text search engine with signal modeling. Um, and signal modeling is just kind of creating categories out of things. So like I mentioned, um, the draft status, you can create categories out of, like an overall draft category out of draft, new, open, and work, all of those different kinds of values. And um, yeah, trying to kind of define those commonalities across our different systems and create that kind of meta schema of all of those different values to be able to search across in one application. Um, and then users can search, yeah, based on this meta schema, and then we can learn more from that once they're actually using the application itself and um, what trends we get out of it once that's up and running. Um, and then, yeah, at a minimum, we should index on these three uh, main criteria used, so we should optimize our search for status, data type, and record ID. And a design strategy for search specifically is that we should investigate a minimal advanced search page to define queries. Um, and this is because as we add more of these systems together and be able to search them all in one place, um, the number of fields and um, different things that you could search on is gonna be a little overwhelming. So we thought that we should do more of a minimal um, kind of upfront search space and then um, instead extract facets um, to be able to trim down that search. So it's a pretty common practice in search. Just think of uh, like Amazon when you search for something and then based on the results you get back, it provides additional categories for you to kind of filter down on and just kind of dynamically search in that way. And um, another line of question we had was our multi-system users. Um, so since we're providing something where a user could search across multiple systems, we needed to know how many users are actually active in multiple systems. Maybe they only need to be in this one system and that's all they need to search on, so maybe they don't need to use this. Um, but turned out that most, um, yeah, you can see there blue is users that are in multiple systems and red is single, so the majority of our users are in multiple systems. And actually about 79% of them, um, but yeah, still a significant number of single system users. So for us, um, 
this kind of helped inform this idea of, I showed this previously where um, this is the search page within a, one system, um, and we were trying to determine at the time whether it would be good to um, put this new functionality of searching across systems within each individual system versus putting it all into one new application. Um, there's trade-offs to both because um, it's kind of like, does the mental model work for our users to put it in an individual system and have them searching across all these things versus do we want to give them another tool that they have to go to to search all of these things and kind of break up their, um, yeah, just give them more tool fragmentation basically. Um, and this is, yeah, the concept I was talking about, one that we tested where um, uh, it's kind of based on like a Slack uh, channel switcher over there on the left. Um, you have different kind of databases that, diff different database systems that you could switch between versus some of our um, more cross-platform functionality like cross-system search. And this was a concept that we um, later speed dated after we did the search log analysis. Uh, so our, for our disinformed design strategies for both search and our team that we should pursue a single platform search concept further. And um, since we did have 79% of users were in multiple systems, it was worth pursuing to look into this concept. And, but still investigate the impact to the single system users as well. Um, and get some reactions to that change to see if that would be um, too much for them potentially for people who are only in one system. And uh, my last kind of insight I'm gonna go over is about digital transformation. Um, and uh, this concept is more about um, once all of this information is, becomes digital, kind of the opportunities and benefits that comes along with this, things that you previously couldn't have uh, potentially conceived of when things were on paper or digital paper and they weren't in accessible databases. Um, so for this, we were looking at how often our searches download and how often our record views downloaded. Um, so how, long, how often are people looking at a, a um, record or a search in our database and then still deciding they want a PDF of it or they want an Excel sheet of that. And uh, at the time, our in-app views were 75, 70, sorry, 95% of the time. And then you can see here um, XLS and CSV downloads um, are, yeah, XLS are about 2.1% and PDF is 1.8. And yeah, so about 5% of searches were downloaded, while you can see here um, for the record views, um, PDF downloads per system versus in-app views. So about 8% of record views were downloaded. And for our insights for this one, um, the, for the different processes at NASA that we've worked on, mass systems have helped kind of bring that reliance on digital paper down to about less than 10%, um, looking at the 8% search results and 5% record views downloaded. Um, whereas, yeah, most of these processes started as about 100% digital paper before we worked with these teams. For our design strategies, um, for search and for other projects for our team, we can use search and user log analysis as kind of a, C, a key success metric for important goals. Um, it was, since this project was kind of, this search log analysis was kind of done post a lot of these processes being converted over, we didn't have a ton of starting metrics on these, but in the future when we're looking at this, it would be something that we could um, get from the beginning and then compare to later um, and yeah, track over time the conversion. And we could also use this to target user research to understand how to inc increase that conversion in the future. And uh, get starting metrics, yeah, on digital paper use early in the stages of user research. And uh, some of our limitations for this project. So first is um, accessibility to doing this kind of research for our team. Um, it's not great. Um, we had a developer on our team and that uh, created this query that you can see here that runs about 20 more lines off the slide. And that's just to find out the last time a user logged in. Um, so when I was looking for, uh, when we were looking for uh, active users to kind of include in this. Um, yeah, it's not, it's not great. Um, we would need a, a bit more work done to um, kind of make this more accessible to the team. And, um, but once we're there, it'd be something that you could kind of constantly reuse for different projects. Um, also our timeline. Um, the logs and the data I've been using was captured over about a 30 day period, um, but that was just based on when our team started using Splunk and where the project was at the time. And um, it was determined to be a pretty 
good gauge, I would say, of the data we were looking at, but the types of searches our users are doing can really vary over time um, based on like time of year, what's going on, but also based on as we get closer to launch, the kind of work they're gonna be doing and the things they're gonna be searching for is definitely going to change. Because it'll, it'll go more from authoring this data to um, that kind of approval process and needing to find what's not approved, where is there still risk that we need to find, um, and then on to potentially um, day of issues. Um, another issue was that the logs aren't currently tied to indivi individual users. So we couldn't actually even filter out our team's data. And um, I would say that we rely heavily on kind of expert shortcuts when we're searching. Um, like in that quick search keyword area I showed you, um, I could type a few keys and get every record in the system. And that's often something I do for the systems I look at because I just want to see everything right away and pick from that list. Um, so that definitely could have skewed data potentially. Um, and then if we had this tied to individual users, we could also get specific um, searches and trends for different user roles within those systems. That could be useful. And lastly, um, you can tell what people are doing by looking at these search logs, but you can't really tell why. Um, so we don't really know what their intent is in running these searches. And you know, when people run searches, over and over, like where does it stop, when did you get what you were looking for, um, and as well as uh, they are, maybe they're using our criteria, criteria search more because maybe the keyword search isn't so great. Maybe that's what they would use if it worked better. Um, so it could be that they're using, whatever they're doing could be a workaround for something they'd like to be doing better. And our kind of key takeaways from this, um, so design takeaways specifically. Um, is that the search log analysis was really great for checking our assumptions and informing our strategies for design direction. Again, not decision making, but strategies for our next few rounds of research that we did based on this information. And that we can learn a lot more from search and our other activity, looking more at the um, search logs and the specific user activity logs as well. And um, yeah, looking at the cross-platform um, kind of application within a single system as well. And for testing, um, that it's crucial for realistic performance testing to be able to know more about what people are doing in search, um, especially when we're testing various systems to make sure things are working okay. We should be looking at more of what people are actually using versus what our, we're assuming they're using. Um, and yeah, prioritizing our most useful, uh, most used features when testing. For development, um, yeah, as we've mentioned, we're heading a lot more towards um, integrated work, and the logs can really improve our understanding of that. Um, what stress is our, our servers under, and when, and uh, how could we improve our uptime based on what people are doing? And we can make ma more maintenance decisions based on past bugs that we're filing, because we could actually run this search log analysis on our own um, bug tracking tool would be really interesting, because we do use our the systems we build for other people is the same system we use to track our own bugs. Um, so we could actually look at our own data and see where, um, which components fail the most, which ones have the most issues, and uh, look through the logs for that information as well. Um, for including data analysis like this in a project, um, I would suggest accounting for about a couple weeks of time, um, especially more if you need a developer or lead time to learn how to use Splunk or whichever tool you're using to set up these metrics. Um, for us, this is, we used it as, a, we counted it as kind of one round of research for us. It was our first round in this pro project. And then second round, we went on to do um, speed dating, like I mentioned. So we did some designs based on this information around the specific features that were used more and targeting the users that we found out of this. And um, yeah, it'll get better and easier as you go along. Um, as you go, you should file logging improvements as you come across them, such as filtering out our own team from the analysis, things like that. And it'll gradually improve, and with those, that with those improvements, our, the rest of our team could be using the same thing on other projects as well, um, how, the way we've set it up. And that's it. No, 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 we don't need to. Yeah. Can I 
ask a question. Okay. Um, mostly we want you to ask questions. But right now I want to discuss two questions. One, one has to do with um, uh, orientation versus focus. And the, old, the whole topic of browsing versus search is, is part of that. And I, I, what I really, you know, I, I, that, that first piece of paper you put up was beautiful in that it showed how difficult it was to line up those signatures. On the other hand, you could see the whole overview of the whole project in place, very small place. So I just wanted you to think about or comment on that. For all the projects Over or Itachi in particular? What? For all the projects or well, for? for your, you, all the projects. I mean, just how, how, you, how you view overview versus focus hmm. is, is a question. And I'll, I have another question later, but I'll let other people ask. Here's, I do think that is one of the challenges for digitizing any paper process is that a lot of times when we're in these engineering communities, people tell us it has to be one page. It has to be one page. Uh, whatever we have, it has to be one page, so I can see it all at once, um, speak, so I can I can tell what what is going on in relation to each other, and that is often one of the drawbacks of moving to a digital system. So for the eTash sheet system, uh, you're getting the context for that individual step. You're losing that one page view. Um, we knew that was a trade off we were making, so we. Uh, identified the, the things that people were struggling with. We worked to identify those things. And then the flip side of that is we provided that in-context help, for example, um, kind of bubbling up those things like the, the completion percentages and things like that, being able to switch between task sheets more easily. So I think it's important to uh, keep in mind that people are losing that, uh, are potentially losing that high level overview and make it so that they have alternate views to to get a summary of, of what's in the sheet and be able to flip, flip back and forth between those things. And that seems to be working out pretty well in Itachi and, and in our other systems. Questions? So the one thing I was wondering about the uh, testing system was what happens if the test gets scrubbed? So, are you talking about, well, it depends. So <laughs> it always depends. So, uh, so there's not necessarily um, a time box when this task sheet uh, has to be completed. So it might be the case that they only do half one day. That's not a problem. They can complete uh, half the next day. But sometimes, so that's, that's one, I think, interpretation of what a scrub could be. Uh, and that's, that's not a big deal, that's fine. Like you can have one task sheet that spans an entire week if they're configuring the facility, totally fine. You can have multiple active at once, they're organized by theme, things like that. How, and then there's another, I think there's another notion of a scrub, and this is if something goes really wrong. Like I mentioned before, the arc check can get harder than the, than the sun. Things can go wrong, um, and then you have to abort the test. Um, and so if you have to abort the test for whatever reason, that could change, like you have toxic materials, they have to be vented, there's all kinds of, of things that might have to have to happen. Um, updates that you need to make uh, with the way that you're removing that, that material from the test, from the, the chamber itself, et cetera. So there's gonna be a lot of edits, a lot of changes, and that's actually one of the ways that Itashi has really helped people because they can just make those edits, they're tracked, it tells you what concurrences you need. So even though you had this anomaly situation, you weren't expecting, you can just focus on the changes you need to, meet, to, to do, and then Itachi is going to do all the tracking and let you know what additional work you need to do. So um, I think in particular, it has helped them with those scenarios to just have like a clear guide of, I made these changes, these are the impacts, just sign them all off and you're good to go. So essentially you're using the change process. Yes, you're just using the change process. When you define your objectives, what are your measurements and units? I didn't see any of them. So how do you determine if some, something is good enough? Um, we, uh, so the way we kind of did it for DEX, at least, is that we defined it with our clients. Um, and the other thing that we uh, try to be clear about is, you know, uh, we can't, you know, we can provide we can use evidence and provide a product that we think will solve the problem. 
we can't like guarantee that you will hit all of your benchmarks right away. But if we take DEX, right, we ran this, uh, like I think I briefly touched on it, right? There's plenty I didn't touch on for that project, but we ran a workshop in which our stakeholders uh, brainstormed various things. So one instance was, I would like to cut down the process by three days on average. Um, and we encourage them to be as tactical as possible. Sometimes you ended up with more strategic stuff because we have clients who aren't quite used to thinking in that way, right? A lot of our clients, for them, success is that the system is delivered. But it's like, well, we don't actually know if this actually did anything. So we worked really hard, at least on that project, too. Um, and you know, the Crystal and Liz are both, you know, uh, really, um, really pushed for this as well. It's, you know, defining those outcomes. Um, but anyway, to actually answer your question, we can work on that beforehand, before the project begins, right? So, or kind of as it's beginning. So for DEX, you know, reduce by three days on average. Someone, one of the more lofty ones was something like, I want to cut the time for the whole process in half or something like that. And at the time, it turned out that, you know, we didn't think that was that achievable. It turned out that we ended up making it four times faster, which is nice. Um, but it varies per project. So. Um, because at least a lot of the projects I've worked on, they have to do with like processes and you know going through step by step, status to status. A lot of it does have to do with time, how many days, how many seconds. One thing that I haven't done a lot of is like you know time to task in the system, right? Like oh, can I do this in like four seconds or whatever it is? We're not really tracing that so much. We're still kind of at a more higher level. Um, I don't know if you'll have any more input onto kind of how you define your metrics and your goals. It really is figuring it out with the stakeholders. And mm -hmm. then we also, uh, like we'll do a brainstorm with them. What does success mean for you? And mm -hmm. then figuring out how can we make that measurable? And then invariably what happens during the, the user research process is that we find additional things. And so we're bringing that back to them. You know, we didn't mention this as a success criteria. This seems really important. Um, do you agree? This is um, how we're planning on measuring it. This is what we're thinking success will look like and working, um, having that conversation back and forth. And sometimes it does make sense. Like I've worked on a project before where it was about the seconds. Like it was taking a long time to upload attachments. In our old system, don't cringe too hard, but you had to upload each attachment at once on a different page. So you click <laughs> upload, attachment, if you have 20 attachments, that's 20 different pages clicking through the, the, the workflow. And so we had, uh, we had real goals on decreasing the time. So we actually did like a GOMS analysis of before and after, what was the cut down on those seconds, um, which is really interesting because some of the places where we saw the biggest increases in efficiency wasn't actually in all those pages. It was things like there was a field that used to be required, it's no longer required. Guess what? No one entered it anymore, and the time to fill out that field drastically cut down um, the amount of time that it took to uh, upload attachments. So there's lots of interesting findings like that where we are we are based on what the what the what the goal is, we are tracking um, those after the fact to make sure that we met them. And sometimes you meet them in surprising ways. That happens a lot. Uh, for Liz on your search project, mm -hmm. uh, a question about the functionality of the search forms. Is mm -hmm. the, if one entered a term in the quick search area mm -hmm. uh, versus someone going to the advanced search and then entering just that same keyword into the um, search field there mm -hmm. on that page and, and hit enter. Are those, or and started the search, are, would those two scenarios have been functionally identical? Um, I believe so for the most part. Um, one interesting thing about our, um, you couldn't, you may not have been able to see in the slide, um, the quick search bar also has a um, drop down next to it that says you could search by either title or all fields. So it depends if you had selected something there. Um, but also in each of our systems on that search page, um, some of our systems designate like default criteria that are automatically selected um, that uh, people sometimes leave or don't. So that could affect your search somewhat. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they'd be the same. Just out of curiosity, can you just go over some of the timeline involved in, in this whole process from uh, kind of like your workshops to design to development to iteration to tracking your metrics for success? Just like what does that look like? Um, yeah. So uh, I think the thing to understand about our team as well is like we're all working at any, you know, on anything from one to five projects at a time. And our team 
if you actually tabulated all the products we support, it's more people than we have on the team. So like the relationship from like calendar time to like actually how many hours spent is different. So Dex, from uh, we started that last August. Um, but what happened was we had like a three week intensive chunk of research and then we did some analysis and then like the holidays occurred and like in there where there was like, you know, a few hours of like talking with clients. And then we started again in earnest. So like it's like year on paper, but you know, we probably spent uh, anywhere from, um, I'm thinking like one to three months kind of like at core dedicated work on that project. And then the process right now for actually determining those metrics is really waiting for people to like use the product. And so we've been monitoring that for the last two months. So Dex, the users of, uh, in that space have these analysis cycles they go through. So gather all the deliveries, approve them all, check, go to the next thing. So they're currently working in an analysis cycle and they've been doing so for the last two months. That's where we're kind of waiting for like records to just be populated in the system and then we can monitor them from end to end. And it's kind of a waiting game because as you saw, like even the shortest ones are like 15 days. So that one's entered. All right. I'll check it in two weeks when it's, you know, when I might have some data on this. Um, and I don't know if there's, yeah, more stuff to add about timelines. Uh, so the things we were all talking about was new products. And I think because there are a lot of times coming up with a new product, you explain the domain, it's a lot easier to, um, to understand the project as a whole. So it really just depends on the complexity of the project, whether we're leveraging our mission assurance system is really a platform that's configurable. You don't always need a code update. So you might be able to do it very fast. Um, it, whereas if you're just doing a feature update or, or um, a small configuration update to a system, it, it'll just be a lot faster. So there's a lot of variation. We have projects that take a year. We have projects that take, um, you know, uh, six weeks or three months or six months. I think the ArcJet, the first deployment, took started in November and we deployed in May, and that was a that was a ton of work. But we also had um, a bunch of people, and um, it was really making a whole new custom site. Yeah, whereas the search project is uh, one that stemmed off of a really broad exploratory research effort that started in May of last year and um, involved um, looking at kind of these integrations and what we're doing with integrated data and what our users want to be doing with that integrated data. And um, instead of actually speaking directly to users at that time, we kind of did a um, what we called as like secondary research where we spoke to our uh, different system owners on our team. So like, for example, Dave for Dex or Crystal for Itachi, we would go and talk to them and talk to them about their um, users' needs and look at that data. And we did the kind of full gamut of research um, methods within that. And that stemmed off several projects. Search was one of three that came out of that effort. And then we dove in more specifically to search and have done uh, several research rounds within it. And we're now in November and are hoping to get our um, first limited uh, release out in December to then do more research. <laughs> oh, yes, and also to be clear, I wasn't talking about, I wasn't sure if you were asking about the research timeline. We were answering in terms of from the beginning of the project, like that first kickoff stakeholders to deployment, how long that takes. So uh, one of the things that I was just wondering, with so many applications that each have different specialized groups of users and things like that, within your 30-person team or organization, how do you find you can share different approaches to problem solving? Is there any idea of convergence of design patterns or anything like that across the team? How does that work within your org? Who's first? <laughs> okay. I could talk about that, I guess. Well, so I think one thing to highlight is especially, like this is something we've worked on as a team for the past year or two now as well, is I think when I joined the team, we might have had half as many mass systems. Has it expanded by double since I've joined? Maybe not that severe. I don't think it's that. It's expanded. It's, <laughs> it's expanded quite a lot though, right? We have this platform and, you know, you go into different, you go into Dex or you go into task sheet or you go into, and it's like, it looks the same, but it's a different color and it has different kinds of data. And you know, before there was a small, smaller team and a smaller number of projects, and so you were able to tackle them more, you know, dedicated in a more dedicated way. Now, especially as we've been tackling some recent projects to like convert the whole site into React instead of using you know older frameworks, we're realizing 
not only is it going to be probably a better user experience for our users to like have more commonality, it's also gonna be way easier to support, right, and maintain. Um, so we definitely are in recent years looking at it more in that way. More and more, if we have um, like a new feature to add to the mission assurance system platform, uh, we will take that into design reviews and say, hey, this is what we're thinking. Here's the user community and their need that generated that. What's going on? You know, it's kind of like a council, right? What's going on with the user communities that you're in contact with? Is this concept of, um, you know, new way of handling attachments, is that something that you think is gonna work for your folks? And we can determine, you know, to what level do we generalize new features we build in? And we're shying away from now more than I think we used to in the past, and I'll, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but the idea of like doing very, very, very bespoke features for individual user communities and saying, because when it comes down to it, and I think, you know, Liz, you've discovered this in your project, right? There are like these broad user types. Like they might have different names, but there are like people who like approve stuff. <laughs> and there's people who like to see everything at once. And there's people who just create things, right? And that's pretty common across all of our different communities. And even the NASA communities themselves are. This is a long way of saying, I agree with you, that's a great question to ask because it's something we are thinking about, I guess, is yeah, like there's definitely a lot of opportunity to standardize that. And I would say it's kind of in, you know, very recent times that we're thinking about it. Um, there's also mentioned design system where kind of on the front end of things, we're trying to like unify those patterns, right? We're trying to create a component library that's just common. So like, instead of having 12 different ways we do buttons, like just have one and it's easier to make. And um, it's just based on various team changes that we're finally kind of able to do that, I guess. Anyway, I'm done rambling. I don't know if, <laughs> I'll turn it back over here again. And I, I had something I wanted to add yeah. to that where, uh, as we're getting closer to actually launching SLS hmm. and like having the mission, and people are using all these different uh, all these different systems, they're now they're now we've had more systems that have been digitized. People are getting exposures to more systems, and so I think that we have an opportunity not just on our team but mm -hmm. also within NASA as a whole, where people want to standardize things. So maybe yeah. five years ago, someone we told someone, well, we already have a system, and they're using Draft. And, this, and that so someone decides that's the hill they're gonna die on. It needs to be in work, in work, or new. It has to be new. And then now we're, and now we're getting to a point where people are using enough systems where they're like, eh, it's all the same stuff. You know, okay. like it's really, we need to standardize this so that we can do searches across systems so that we don't spend as much time training people. And this is coming from the user communities themselves. This is not coming from, uh, this is not coming from management. Like we'll, we'll be doing research with folks and we know what their process is and they're like, I know who you guys are. I use your other system. I know we do it this way right now, but let's just standardize it with these other systems we're already using. So we are seeing a convergence that's actually coming from the user communities where they say, we know this is our current process. We want it to be standardized. It's gonna make it a lot easier to search. We're actually hoping to use, um, once we deploy the cross-system search, use that as a tool to kind of potentially push that agenda a little bit is once you put that in front of them and they can see the variance across all these different things. They'll say, why are we doing it this way? We should really clean this up to make this, facilitate this more. So I wanted to uh, interject the announcement that you in the audience may notice that all three of our speakers are wearing the red badge saying, I'm hiring. And so at the end of the, this large group question time, you can mix and mingle. We have other people wearing yeah. I'm hiring badges and we have several people still in the audience with the green looking for opportunities badges, and so we hope everybody will mix and mingle and meet one another. And I believe, is it true we have a confirmed speaker for next month? Uh, and so, pa Smitha, why don't you announce that, and then we'll go back to asking questions. So for next month, since it's the last month of the year, we wanted to kind of highlight um, um, one of our speakers who was the original, I guess, founders of Beikai, and Beikai has been you know, doing these programs, bringing people together interested in HCI for over 25 years. Coming so up to 30, <laughs> Ellen, Ellen will tell you that because she was a chair of Beikai many yeah. years ago. So we'll be hearing from Richard Anderson, who's, um, you know, who's uh, gonna talk to us about uh, bringing in the old, but also bringing in the new and how, you know, HCI has evolved, but also not. 
uh, over the years. Well, he's one of the founding members, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know, Nancy. And he, he was the, the program chair for Baikai for the first 12 years, so that was a big deal. He did the whole thing by himself, and when he resigned from that role, retired from that role, uh, I think we needed four or five people to pick up all the pieces and take on <laughs> all those roles. So now we have not just me and Smita on the program team, but Stacy who prepares the slides and talks, makes the interface with the facilities, and two people who are working on AV, Fred and Jeff in the booth, and several other people in the background who you don't get to see, but Richard used to do it all. And so we're really excited that he's gonna come back and, and grace us, and I, I guess, are you gonna interview him or is he just gonna talk? Yeah, he has a talk on you okay. know how we are always very excited about new things that we want to do, but there's a lot of value in kind of retrospect, looking back and reflection, and kind of how that can be you know used in when we create new things. Yeah, super. Thanks so much, Smitha. Well, and I'm, yeah, more I'm questions. Sure there's, uh, I'm sure people want to leave soon. <laughs> I had I said I had two questions, so I'm going to ask my second, and then probably we have have time for one. Maybe I don't know how how long you guys can stand up the year, but I'm I'm very much enjoying you guys. This is a lovely uh, set of large number of stories that you're talking about, and what I guess um, is obvious to me is you coming. You're always coming in a situation where people are entrenched in a process, and at first I was thinking to myself, gosh, how could their approach not be very rearview mirror oriented because they're interviewing them, watching them do what they do, and then asking them what they want. And yet I, I hear glimpses of, of them, you know, wanting what you're giving other people, of, of you introducing new things, and it doesn't seem like everyone's resisting it. Why aren't they resisting it? And how are you getting vision into this process as you're, as you're doing this ethnographic style um, design uh, work? Yes, I will address that question. <laughs> so I think what has been really important with us is partnering with our stakeholder community and with the, with the users that we meet with. Um, so because they're really the best evangelists for uh, changes in process, I think that there's a lot of history at NASA of someone competing for a contract, coming up with software, bringing it in and saying this is what you have to use. So there's this innate distrust of any uh, software development organization coming in and explaining like this is the future, what you're, this is what you're going to use. Now there's a lot of people who are familiar with our team who's worked with us before, but it's always our policy that we are not selling software to people, we want people to want to use it, and the best people to do that are evangelists within their community. So we work really quickly, really closely with people, uh, we help people set up presentations. Um, we work, help with them with strategy. Like we help give them the materials that they need to go out and do that in their communities. Um, we listen. We we do. Uh, we actually are the folks who are answering customer service uh, questions um, and helping to provide them with any additional training materials or whatever it is that they need, which helps us both learn about the product, but also form those relationships so that those that people then learn about the system, they become uh, our communicators within those communities. And that has been the most successful because um, everyone believes the person sitting in the cubicle next to them when they tell them something. Us, they don't necessarily know. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's worked out really well for us. Yeah, I was gonna say that, yeah, it's, uh, for me who's not worked uh, at NASA for as long as the team has existed, like. A bunch of people did a lot of hard work that then now I get to benefit from, basically, right? Is like the team has been around for 15 years and basically building trust with our client base over time. So that, you know, I mean, I think there was a time when uh, like that was not the case and there was a lot of mistrust, right? And now it's the opposite. It's, you know, that there is that grassroots effort. And then even on individual projects, right? Like I tried to, on Dex, we tried really hard to just like listen, 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 listen. And you know, we got to the point where I was on the phone once and um, you know, two of our stakeholders were like having this very in-depth, somewhat heated conversation of just about like, you know, how something ought to be or how it was and why it process should to be this way. And they went, oh Dave, you're still on the phone. Oh, we like having you here for emotional support. <laughs> but like, I really took that as a compliment because it meant that there was trust in me and trust in our team that they could have those conversations and they knew that like we were not there to judge or prescribe, we were there to guide them through and say, here's what we're hearing and here's what we're thinking and you know, 
are there times when I think it would, you know, like I'm looking at a problem and I'm like, why are all these forms involved? Why don't you get rid of them all? But the reason is someone made that for a reason, not just, you know, bureaucracy for bureaucracy sake. It's we're building this huge complex vehicle that we're expensive. going to put people on. Yeah, and it's expensive. And we want to make sure that it flies. And like, there's a lot of care taken and people who are very passionate about making sure that's the most safe thing available and making sure that's gonna be very successful. So it's not our job to go in and say like, what's this bureaucracy? It's our job to listen and like help where we can over time. And every time we kind of put in a patch, oh look, now signatures only take you a few you know, seconds instead of whole days. Well, then the next thing, on the next time you do the project, they might say, hey, I'm thinking we need five fewer signatures. And you make that process, you make that you know, progress like very iteratively over time. Um, but it takes a while to get there, I guess. I think we've exhausted the group <laughs> question. <laughs> Thank you yeah. all for coming. I, Thank our speakers. Thank you for your questions. People might uh, want to come up and talk to them up there afterwards also.